everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, your host and co-producer of these chats with Mistress Joanne Gaddy. Today, I am back on Zoom because we're still in the middle of COVID. It is uh, Sunday, the 4th of October, 2020, and I am here with Scarlett Sin, who's in beautiful, warm uh, Los Angeles. Whereabouts in Los Angeles? Um, I'm in the north end of the San Fernando Valley. But let's start right at the very beginning. Uh, you were originally from Budapest, Hungary. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about your early life there. Well, I, I can only tell you about my very early life and then large gap and continued life. Um, yes, I was born there back in the time and era and regime that uh, I thought would be lost to history, but hey, what's old is new again, apparently. Um, so good old communism and authoritarianism and all that jazz, and I just dated myself. But um, had to leave when I was two to follow my parents that left when I was eight months old. And if you're doing the math, um, they left a little over a year before I, I did and after many trips to local uh, politicians, congressmen, and it was with the assistance of um, a young aide, uh, Alphonse D'Amato, that the um, path really started and attention was given and political pressure was placed on Hungary to release me. So I had my 15 minutes of fame, I guess, in the New York Times arriving at JFK reunited with my parents. What, were, what was being asked of your father? in this restaurant that he had, you know, you would have journalists meeting with artists, meeting with politicians, meeting with, you know, all different elements. You would have the, the folks coming out of the factory at uh, early morning hours um, from the night shift. And it was just a, a melange of all different elements of society. And so the, those in power wanted to know who's meeting with who, what are they talking about? Um, what are they plotting? If they're even plotting anything other than whether they're gonna have dessert after their main course or not. Um, and so in that situation, it is the duty of every citizen to uh, cooperate. And uh, my father decided that's not a country he wants to live in. And my mother wholeheartedly agreed. When they left, how did they leave the country? They were actually able to leave um, because apparently my grandfather, or sorry, my great-grandfather, um, worked in the Ministry of Justice, and it was through his contacts that it was kind of back-channeled that they were planning to um, file charges against my father. So he, he kind of beat the clock on that one, and um, if he hadn't left, then, then that following week, like literally that Monday, the charges would be filed, he would have been arrested and all of that. But since that hadn't gone through yet, they were able to... Um, uh, leave um, through the airport, just like any anyone else. And by the time they realized they were gone, it was too late. Oh my um, gosh. You know, and still, I mean, that's, looking at the news and looking at what's happening today, I mean, that's so much of a far cry and, and, it, and it makes, it kind of makes me feel like, what, what, what did they or what do I even have to complain about as compared to folks who are trying to enter this country with darker skin and from a different border who um, are now facing considerably more harm and hardship. Yeah, yeah. But you mentioned when we were preparing for this that you stayed in the US for a number of years, but then you ultimately mm -hmm. went back to Hungary. Yeah, um, faced with the reality of no family in the States, I'm an only child. Um, and family still there, and a husband who left, and was not under good circumstances. And a child entering that period of their life when uh, children become difficult beyond measure. Uh, she decided that it would be best to be with family, and we ended up moving back. And um, it was something that, for years, I. I you know, I, I held against her and I couldn't forgive her for. And looking back on it now, it was probably the best decision that she could have made. And I'm grateful for it. You lived, you were homeless for a time. Yeah. Yeah. So I ended up, uh, I ended up leaving home 
when I was uh, 16. My um, mother uh, met a man who is no longer in our lives, thank God. Uh, but, but at the age of 16, and it reached the age and size and ability that uh, no one was going to lay their hands on me. And my stepfather did it one too many times. And uh, right before I left, I, well, the time before that, I warned him that you try that again and see what happens. And he tried it again. And I packed while he lay on the floor, holding his jaw, wondering what the hell just happened. Um, wow. Wow. But you also said a moment ago that going back to Hungary when you did, you now realize it was a good thing. Why, why was that the case? going to Hungary after the wall came down and seeing what that world was like and seeing what it is forming into and and connecting with my roots and my family and traditions and it's it's irreplaceable plus the Hungarian education system is phenomenal um, so I, I, I was really able to gain the ability of not just going to school, but going to school in a manner where everything was contextual. When we were learning about, you know, uh, the, the Renaissance and art, we were also doing the same in music class. We were also going through literature from that period. We were learning about history, what was happening in mathematics. So all of it was within context. So it wasn't just like blank dates and facts and people and, and, and dry and uninteresting. So it, it, it actually stuck. But you, were, you, you just mentioned that you've had the privilege of being able to extensively travel. And you told me that you did a life finding journey some years ago. You visited amazing places. Tell us about that. This was a journey that wasn't really necessarily of my choice. Um, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's hard to describe. I'm not gonna preface it too much, but you know, I, there was a period in my life where I just, I felt lost, just, something that I had sort of planned for, uh, hoped for, um, worked towards for the majority of my life at that point, uh, didn't really work out the way that I wanted it to. And so I'd returned to Hungary and um, just sort of existed for the better part of six months. And, you know, you wake up in the morning, but you don't really wake up. There's no real purpose. There's, you do things, but there's really no hope to do things greater than the regular and mundane. Um, not really connecting with friends, not really looking for what the future might hold, um, but still existing. And I don't know what it took me, but one morning I woke up, went down, made my coffee. Um, I was living with a friend at that time. And I went back upstairs and packed a bag, um, some clothes, some basic stuff, and left. And so started the better part of the next year um, never boarding a plane, but going through Southern Europe, um, crossing over Northern Africa, heading back East, going through the Middle East, South Asia, um, and ending up in Southeast Asia and staying wherever I was long enough to just, you know, until the motive came to, um, keep moving, um, not it's because I've been so many countries where people are like, oh yeah, have you been to you know X Y Z touristy city or seen the monument that you're apparently obli uh, <laughs> obligated to see in said city? And and I and I really didn't. Um, I I intentionally avoided anything touristy, um, which you know there were some things <laughs> I, I regret, but um, but yeah, it was just about just going until I didn't feel the drive to go anymore. You mentioned that you didn't board an aircraft, so you went by sea, by train? Um, whatever means possible. Um, sometimes hitchhiking, sometimes bus, um, some of it boat, um, some of it foot, some of it horseback, some of it camelback. Um, yeah, just whatever got me to where I needed to go. What were the most amazing places you saw? Places that no longer exist in the form that I saw them. Um, places that have been ravaged now by, by war and devastation. Um, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya. I mean, I, I don't know if there's any particular place and 
the reasons why it would make it particularly interesting or memorable are probably not so for for anyone just watching this and hearing about it, but they were for me. But knowing that I've been to places and I've met with people that, that don't exist and for all the wrong reasons, yeah. that, that, talk about perspective. You also told me when we were preparing for this, that in your life, you like to do a lot of things sort of on a lark. Tell us about I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I think, I think, um, that might be overstating it, but but I, I'll put it to you this way. There are certain things that um, I feel my heart draws me towards. Um, and that's one thing that I promised myself is whatever I've ventured into, uh, whether it be a career path, whether it be um, a relationship, whatever it may be, um, I promised myself that I, I will only do it as long as my heart is fully vested in it. Um, I don't want to fill this with cliches, but like the whole life's too short thing, but the life is too short. Um, why keep doing something if your heart's not in it? And I also recognize the astounding privilege in that statement and trust. Uh, it, it has definitely led to me not probably being as far along in certain areas of my life than I could have been. But I also don't feel like if tomorrow was my last day, I would, my last words would be, I only wish I, so. Hmm. Okay. Well, moving over a little bit again, tell us about your gender affirmation. Oh boy, jumping right into that one. Um, well, plot twist for those who, you know, have better things to do than follow me. Um, so this didn't always exist in this form. Um, actually, at one point I probably looked more like you, Doug. Um, and let's get into that for a second because there's, there's a twist to that statement. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I think now looking back, and I don't want to like hindsight 2020 this that much, but I realized that for the majority of my life, I, I had a, sort of like a, a white noise, like something just didn't fit right. Um, no pun intended. Um, and and now that I'm on this side of it, and you know, it's still a journey. It just, to me, transition is lifelong. Um, I finally know that before, I, what, what I knew as happiness, what I know as happiness now, I, I, as a 10, I may have experienced at best a five for the majority. Um, this feels right. This, who I am now feels correct. And, um, you know, I'm not going to blame anyone else, but yeah, it, it sucks that, uh, sorry, it sucks that for, for so darn long, I had to deal with the fact that um, I found it more important to please the ideals of others and um, the ideals of society on, well, if this is what we gave you the card for, then this is the door you go into. Um, no, you can't change that. Like that's predetermined for you. And so, pardon my French, fuck that. Um, we ourselves are, are the only determining factor in who we are and what labels we wish to affix and throw away and um, even if the majority of society decides otherwise. Okay, so building on that a little bit, when, when we were- You more personal. Well, yes, I, 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 I'd like to know more about your your true feelings on some of that, maybe some of the challenges you've faced and difficulties you've had to navigate. I, I keep thinking that someday someone's going to look at this video and see you as an example of what they can do as well and what they can achieve. And so I'd like to know more about some more of the roots of it, I guess. Are you setting me up for the role model? I, oh, heavens. Well, I, certainly hope, I certainly hope not. I, I certainly hope that there will be a vast plethora of folks that exist um, of, in all walks of life who have gone through their own transitions with, without so much of what folks of my generation have and definitely those of prior generations whose shoulders I stand on. Like I remember walking into the leather archives uh, back in I think 2017, 
um, when I was there during my, my title year um, to support my sash husband for his run at IML. And it was my first time in the archives. And I remember walking up and there was one panel um, that had, I believe, maybe like nine, nine different folks of, of trans experience that, you know, were, were intertwined with our shared history of, of kink and leather and all of that. And there was a small part of me that was, was happy because at least there was something. And then I look around the room and you know, see all of this vast, rich history of what people presume to be cisgender folks. I, you know, we, we don't know for most of them because they're no longer with us, but probably correctly. And, and, and it made me sad that um, we're only just now starting to collect this history. So, you know, my, my own history, I mean, when, when I look back, I, I may have been like six, seven years old and I remember my parents uh, worked all the time. And my first exposure to anything related to even trans was coming across the videotape, an unmarked videotape, because my father would always record things. And again, dating myself, VHS, look it up if you don't know, you youngins. Um, and it was transgender porn. And I remember just like not being able to look away because I didn't, like my brain could not process this configuration of, but, but what's here is that, but what? Netflix has an amazing documentary called Disclosure, and you can look back and see, like, while, while you know, gay men and, and lesbians and, and even bi folk, folks of, of sexual um, minority communities um, started, especially 80s, 90s, um, started to get folks that, that were role models, were, were, or as one of my you know, favorite trans women, Laverne Cox, would say, possibility models started emerging um we didn't we didn't get that what we got was we were the, the the tragic prostitute we were the murder victim we were the the psycho killer we were the the, the laugh line the the trap the um the, the punch line at the end of the joke where oh dude you slept with <laughs> and so internalizing that and looking back on that realizing that if this is who I was, my opportunities in life, my, my, my paths in life were either I'm a, a, a fetish object or, or I'm this like tragic character that doesn't get to determine their own fate and will probably cross paths with violence, if not worse, um, at least once, if not twice, if not. And I think that's sort of the reason why it just got shoved down and, and hidden and um, I convinced myself that no, 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 no. You just like to cross-dress on occasion. That's, that's all this is. Mm. And it took better part of another you know, two decades, almost three, before um, I finally had that conversation with myself and stopped gaslighting myself. And uh, I couldn't come up with a good enough reason why this is anything less correct than, uh, yeah. And, and it's one of the toughest decisions a trans person can make is to, to live an authentic life, to, to come out, to, to be out in, in reality. Because, you know, even today, I mean, especially today now that we're reversing even the progress we made in the last decade, um, you're pretty much losing everything. Like the possibility of losing everything is very much right there in front of you losing family, losing friends, losing a job, losing your, your living situation, losing whatever possibility for income you might have, losing um, health care, like losing your life. And, and I say that as a white trans woman, like I can't even imagine when, when it comes to, to my black sisters and, and my other sisters of color um, who just like every year at Trans Day of Remembrance coming up again this November, it's, it's another list of names that we read and, and, and names of people that we don't even know until tragedy befalls them. I feel I was fortunate. I had a partner who stayed with me throughout, who I'd been with for a long time in what was seeming to be a cisgender heterosexual couple. Um, I, I clawed through the, the, the system that denied me health care until um, I got the system changed, or you know, I'm not going to take full credit, but was a 
was a cog in that wheel. Uh, there's a cog in that machine. When we were preparing for this interview, you did mention that trans people face vast differences in the legal and social circumstances as opposed to other people. Talk with us a little bit about that. I mean, what, what, what can I say that, you know, unless folks have had their heads under a rock, um, when, when, when the so-called, you know, community, the acronym community um, decided after Prop 8 fell and after um, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of, of um, same-sex marriage, that, you know, the fight was over, that, you know, we still got little pockets here. Trans folks still couldn't get a job in 32 states without facing discrimination. They still couldn't um, have protections for, for um, their, their living circumstances, uh, be denied housing or thrown out of housing for, for being trans. Um, and, and not to mention the, the violence. Yes. And, and that still persists. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I came out of the gate not with this idea that I'm going to be this like firebrand activist, advocate, what have you, but when faced with a situation of like constant, um, the looks, the, the comments, the, 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 the miseducation, the authority figures, the, the gatekeeping, the denial, the, the, you know, being in a community or, or entering into a community that is just experiencing so much hopelessness and despair and injustice is something that since a child since childhood it just it, it, i have a visceral reaction to it and so as i mentioned before I, I i had the privilege of having a partner i had the privilege of having a roof over my head i had the privilege of, of, of many a thing many a tool and to me privilege is only worth something as if, if you use it for the benefit of others who don't have it so so yeah, I, I stepped up, I stepped out, I, I did many a thing, I made many a mistake, I made many a learning opportunity from said mistakes, but I wasn't immune um, to what? that violence myself. Um, you know how I learned what it's like to be a woman? And this is, this is terrible. I went out to dinner with a friend, um, a very dear friend, in, in a part of this city that you would not consider unsafe by any measure. And I remember walking back to my car and there I was, nice summer dress, heels, feeling great about myself, not realizing that I'm, I'm a woman now and I don't, I don't get to do that in this world without looking over my shoulder, without being aware of my surroundings. And, um, and it cost me that night. One of the things that I worked on, um, the film, The Danish Girl, that came out a few years ago with Eddie Redmayne, I was um, afforded the opportunity of working with him in preparation for that role. And one of the things that he speaks about, and that you can glean some of real true understanding um, from these words, this is about, um, the first trans woman back in the 1920s, early 30s, who underwent the first ever gender confirmation surgery. Oh, okay, okay. And, 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 and in her own story, the, the violence, the lack of understanding and compassion, the denial, the gatekeepers and all of that. And we're a hundred years later and it's still here. It's still present. And, and not just in, in cisgender and heterosexual communities, but in the so-called community of, of sexual and gender minorities. Um, even though we're lumped in an acronym together, many a times the violence, the beratement, the lack of understanding, the, the, um, the terribleness can come from those who, you know, we're all supposed to be under a rainbow flag together. So it's tough. Yeah. It's really tough when, when what, what I know as community, so to speak, those who have, have gone through some sort of experience of, of being trans, whether it's, you know, surgical or not, whether it's societal or not, whatever form they understand their gender as other than cisgender, there's not a whole lot of us. And until, a, you know, 
fairly lately, we're not a community with a wealth of resources or acceptance or so we got to fight for our lives, like our lives dependent on it because more often than not, that is the case. You mentioned a moment ago, yes, you've made mistakes in this whole journey. Well, for example, what mistakes do you think you made? There, there are a few. Um, and, and I want to turn back to, to a comment you made about, and, and I know this, this is not, I'm not trying to read into it or, or, or figure there was intentionality or anything that I'm trying to imply, but one thing that I've become sensitive to is, is when people do talk about um, my presentation, my looks, um, for the most part, I can navigate this world as sort of cis presenting, or at least have enough ambiguity that, that most would not read me as, um, as anything, but you know, she's tall, she's a little bit broad shouldered, with might be a little bit, whatever, whatever it may be. And please don't tell me if you want to point out something because that's really shitty. Um, not you personally, but just general third person. Don't do that to trans folks. Um, but, but this idea that like we, especially trans women, have to like be able to blend to somehow that that is the measure of success. So that is our, the measure of our acceptability in society. Um, and and one of the mistakes for me was I never when I began my transition, like I said, I never had any idea that this was in the cards for me, that, that I would be able to have lending privilege, that I would be able to be in the world as, as just a woman, and not a, a woman with an asterisk, not always have to be trans, not always have to be dealing with the looking over the shoulder, you know. In fact, that's how I, that's how I started my career as a pro -dom. That's how I entered the leather community. Um, me coming out to this, general larger community didn't occur until years later, literally on the stage at my competing for international Ms. Leather. Um, but the shitty thing that I did in those years, and, and I think I will never forgive myself for this, is there was a period when I, when I wanted to just be a woman, when I would consciously avoid sisters of mine who didn't have that privilege because their proximity outed me. And, and I think that's something that um, I'm not alone in. I've, I've had conversations with others who have gone through something similar and, and it's unforgivable, like, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's, that's definitely something where I've made mistakes. You mentioned a few moments ago working with um, the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very important piece that I want to make sure we thoroughly cover. You worked, you worked to eliminate gender reaffirmation restrictions from medical insurance coverage. Right. Tell us about that. <sighs> oh, talk about privilege and naivete. So um, when I first came out, I you know, I've watched my fair share of documentaries. Thankfully, internet already existed at that point. And so um, I, I did my due diligence and research and what was out there and what was available and what people were doing and so forth. And I also realized um, <laughs> upon going into Kaiser member services, um, who I was with and sitting down and going very hushed tone, um, well, here I am, this is my name, this is my member number, and so probably gonna need some, gotta visit a therapist to get my letters and all that, because you need two letters to be able to access services. Um, and then, you know, hormones, and then, you know, they're probably surgery. <laughs> um, what, what do you mean two, you require two letters? What? Oh, well, so to be able to start treatment at that point of any measure, even even like getting a linkage to an endocrinologist for hormone replacement therapy, you needed to visit a, a qualified mental health professional. Um, and for surgery, it had to be two from two qualified mental health professionals because oh, oh, oh. of course, you know, <laughs> me being a mental health professional now, 
part of the reason I went after these degrees, so I could like, stick it to the man. Um, they are better agents of our identities than, than we are. And I say that with not a small helping of sarcasm. Uh, fortunately, we're moving much closer to an informed consent model and not the gatekeeper model that it was. Um, but in, in my situation, reaching across or sitting there with this member services person, um, she very kindly and condescendingly looked at me, smiled and said, oh, honey, we don't offer any of that. And then showed me my plan where right there, specific paragraph, dedicating a whole paragraph to it, um, talking about how any type of trans care was excluded. Okay. And I couldn't understand what, why this was. And on further research, yeah, back in years past, many years past, um, certain things were covered, other things weren't. Uh, but all of that got eliminated. And in fact, the, even the designation under the DSM-4, um, the manual used to uh, identify and bill for uh, mental health conditions, um, we were listed as a disorder, uh, oh. gender identity disorder. Fortunately, DSM-5 changed that. Still issues, we can get into that if you want, but, but I couldn't understand why something that was recognized by increasing numbers of medical professional organizations uh, would be deemed something that insurance companies could arbitrarily exclude. So again, injustice. And I started doing what I could. I figured out who that person's um, supervisor, oh God, I pulled a Karen. Um, but I, I, I basically kept going up the food chain and getting nose and nose and nose and I realized very quickly that I'm probably not going to get any type of results or satisfaction within that organization so what laws are justifying this or are even allowing this and so what needs to change and slowly but surely building the connections and, and network and, and showing those that had already been in the trenches um, that no I'm, I'm, I'm not a fly-by-night person, but I'm dedicated and committed and whatever it takes. And so it took, it took a bit. Um, looking back, I can't believe that we actually thought that we were going to win this. But, you know, we did have some, some pretty, pretty timely help with the Affordable Care Act passing, which yet again might be pulled out from under us um, by, by what's happening currently. Hmm. Uh, but the, the elimination of exclusions for pre-existing conditions, the, the anti-discriminatory language, um, all of that assisted greatly, uh, but it wasn't the final straw. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a longer story. I don't want to get too far into it, but we, we got the rules changed here in California. And since then, most states um, now cover it in some form or another. Kaiser covers it throughout their entire network even. Okay. Uh, I don't know if Georgia, for example, has changed the law, but Kaiser covers it for their members there, even when the law wasn't that. So, so it's it's a continuing battle, but it's it's healthcare, and and there's no further proof of its effectiveness than looking at the the mental health issues that um, those trans folks deal with who who want to medically transition um, through whatever means that means to them and are denied that care, um, the depression, the anxiety, the levels off the charts, and being able to have the access to that and being able to live a life authentic in a body that feels authentic, those issues no longer exist or, or exist in a far um, smaller level. So, yeah. You mentioned a change with the DSM-5. Uh, yeah. Please fill us in a little bit on that. Well, the fact that we're still in the DSM is problematic um, unto itself, but it, it got changed in the DSM-5 from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria. Um, so it's no longer a disorder. And there's reasons why it should be, or there's reasons why it shouldn't be. Um, shouldn't be because it's, you know, it's... It, oh, boy. It, it's pathologizing. It's still pathologizing to us. 
but the reason that it needs to be in there is because somebody needs to bill for it. Um, but when it was gender identity disorder, there were families that were broken up and custody battles lost to trans parents because the other parent could come into the court and say, well, my partner, you know, former husband, wife, what have you, um, has a documented mental disorder and so would be an unfit parent for our children and would lose custody cases as such. So it was a double-edged sword. On one side, it, it, it sort of allowed us kind of a back door to some level of medical coverage. Um, and on the other side, it pathologized us and placed us in, in categories where we don't belong. What advice can you offer someone navigating gender affirmation? Follow your own path. There, there's no one true way to transition and don't let anyone else tell you uh, what is right for you. Like I said, for some folks, transition is changing a pronoun. For some folks, it's a wardrobe reboot. For some folks, it's getting an ID that, that matches who you feel you are. For some folks, it's um, hormone therapy or, 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 or surgery and what surgery that entails. Like even the, the, the notion that when people talk about the surgery, it's always around genitals. Uh, There's people that I know that for them, gender confirmation is the part of their body that everyone sees on a daily basis when they walk out. It's whatever feels right to the individual. And it's not for anyone else to decide who is or isn't trans enough or woman enough or man enough or non-binary enough or even, you know, this, pardon me, but idiocy around they not being understood as a plural and, and so, like, get with it, get with it. You, you mentioned a little bit ago that you're an associate clinical social worker. Tell us about that. What drew you to that and what does it entail? And I want to make a correction. I meant to say they not being a singular, not a plural. Um, yeah, so part of the path, um, literally my first day out uh, in public as like fully embracing my identity was going back to school. So, you know, if you're really into edge play, um, come out as a trans woman who is definitely not uh, um, having any sort of blending privilege and entering a school of about, I don't know, 5,000, um, let's just say fairly conservative-minded folks in a part of this town that, yeah. I, in the process of transitioning, I, I met my therapist for the first time. He's still my therapist after all these years. Um, a very lovely gay man, because of course all of us like, you know, queers and gender non-conformings and, and all of that have to be shoved to the, the one gay therapist, because of course, you know, that makes sense. But um, in this instance, I lucked out and I thought he was pretty darn awesome. And I realized, huh, the social work thing. So there's the micro, the meso, the macro. I could be a clinical therapist that does the work that he does and assist other folks who can't afford or can't get to that kind of care. Um, but I can also have these letters after my name that of course in our society, you have to have letters after your name to open certain doors. Um, but I can get through certain doors and, and change systems uh, because ultimately, if you're not careful, even with the best of intentions, when you're only doing the micro, you may very well just be reinforcing the status quo. Yeah. And that's not something that I wanted to be a part of. So the majority of my career work, even while going back, getting my bachelor's, getting my master's, uh, centered around micro work was policy, was legislation, was lobbying, was, was doing whatever the hell I needed to do when somebody said no to uh, my, my, my friends and my siblings in the community uh, to, to make it so that they get a yes. Um, and, and recently I've, I've decided that let's get a little bit more of lettering behind the name because whatever, um, but, but also be able to actually engage in that clinical element. So last year I got my um, certificate for just to start getting my hours towards uh, becoming a licensed clinical social worker. So tell us about your entry into the kink community. Oh boy. 
All right. I was, I was wondering when we were going to take it out pivot. Um, interestingly enough, I, I kind of, the way I describe it is like, I, I didn't discover kink. It was more, I discovered kind of like the words and acronyms because just like in the military kink community loves its acronyms. Yeah. Um, for, for these feelings of like who I've always been. Um, and so it was, oh boy. I mean, actually entering a, what, what, what any semblance of like community was probably, ooh, like 2014, 2013, somewhere around that. So not that long ago. Um, and I jumped in with two feet because um, not only did I, did I start like going to a dungeon and, and doing that kind of thing, uh, but I had gone to a class at one of our local dungeons here in Los Angeles that uh, also serves during the day as a, a pro house for, for professional doms and, and switches and subs. And during the break of that class, the lady at the front desk asked me if I had ever considered um, working there. And, you know, talk about on a lark. I said, well, no, but I don't know, might be interested. Oh, let me get a, let me get you an interview with the mistress. Let's see if she's here. And next thing you know, uh, a week later, I was, I, I was hired and I, I worked there for uh, almost five years. Tell us a little bit about your work as a pro dom. Uh, being a pro dom, you know, people who look at what pro doms do or, or what have you, many people have these ideas in their head and some people think that we're just in it for the money. Um, I'm not gonna lie, some people I'm sure they are, but just like with everything else, I don't, I don't do anything for just the money because uh, that's how you start hating it and that's how you start having regrets and especially something like kink and BDSM. If, if your heart's not in it, if all you're doing is for money, is you're phoning it in, if, you're, if your ego is what's driving you, oh boy, it's, it's just a matter of time till, till you cause some harm. Um, and that's something I, I've never wanted to do. Uh, so, you know, met a whole wide swath of people over the years, both colleagues, clients, um, had the opportunity to travel through it, had the opportunity to do self-reflect. Uh, it was sort of my, my coming into my womanhood and realizing my sexuality, but also it was, it was confidence building. It was, I entered that wor world with very, very few knowing about my past and, and me being trans. Um, you know, I was, I was doing this work presumed to be cis and accepted as such. And even, you know, maybe it's my naivete, I don't know, but people usually aren't very good about not pointing it out if they realize it or, or, or somebody told them, which is crappy, don't do that. Um, but it was what I needed it to be at the time I needed it to be. In the mornings I would go to, I would go to uh, uh, school, getting my degree in psychology and then going into the dungeon and learning firsthand. It was almost like practicum of human psychology and, and, yeah. and what drives people and what, what, what motivates them and what are their fears and what are their shames and what, what are their anxieties. And, and um, yeah, I, I feel like I got hands-on learning that, uh, that no one else did, at least not in my class. It definitely made for very interesting giggles coming from my corner uh, anytime my psychology professor would talk about CBT. <laughs> Any words of wisdom, any advice for people exploring that line of work? If you're just entering it now, seriously question whether you want to do it. Um, the rules and laws have changed federally. Uh, FOSTA-SESTA has all but made it impossible to be a sex worker and do it safely um, and, and have, have a solid income. Um, make sure you have an exit plan. Make sure that that is not the idea that you're going to be doing, thinking that you're going to retire off of it. Make Pay your taxes if you do, because I don't care how big of a domly dom you think you are, uh, IRS will make you his bitch. 
but the most important thing is be yourself. Don't try to create something that you're not. Because, uh, you know, if, if, if you're going to go in there and try to pull off the, well, I'm going to be the, you know, big Billy badass Dom and you're just a sweet little thing otherwise, and, you know, you're a cute little blonde thing and, and, and you try to do the whole like Betty Page thing, guess what? There's about 20 other girls who probably can do it a lot better because that's who they are. I, I never put on an act. I was never anything different than who I am in, in life. Um, for better or for worse, I may have amped up certain characteristics, but what you saw in the playroom during the scene is who I am, and it worked for me. I'm not saying that's necessarily the trick, it worked for me, but the ones that I've seen the most successful are the ones who really tapped into the core of their own being, and through that were able to really give their heart, their authenticity, because the last thing you want to do is be going into sessions and engaging with clients who know exactly what they want and realize you're filming it in. It's not going to make for good experiences for anyone. Tell us about competing in IMSL in 2018. Oh, looking back, all, all I can say is looking back, I'm happy I didn't win. You're happy you did not win? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and, and it's... It was one of the toughest things that I've ever been through for all the wrong reasons. Um, everything that I've done, uh, for me, it was, you know, win, lose, or draw, it doesn't matter. And, and my perspective obviously has changed as a result. But one thing I know, especially now as a producer, if, if I have a contestant who goes through uh, one of the titles that I produce, I want to make sure that they have everything they need to be successful. Not, and that's not measured by who wins and who doesn't, but who goes through that experience and challenges themselves and grows and learns something about themselves as a result um, and comes out of it. Maybe not the title holder, but as somebody who is a better person for it. And I honestly cannot say that a good number of our class could say that. And that, to me, is, is a tragedy. But you mentioned that you produce contests, Ms. L.A. Leather, and you launch <laughs> both L.A. Boot Black and MX L.A. Leather. Tell us about these. What are these contests? Shea Flanagan, who had brought back Ms. Los Angeles Leather just two years prior, uh, after a 17-year sort of dormancy, I don't, you know, I'm not at liberty to, to go into details and I want to respect Shay's, Shay's privacy, but for, for various reasons, um, she couldn't continue producing. And I sent her a message and said, this is two weeks before heading up to San Jose to compete for Imsel. Um This, this title means a lot to me and it means a lot to Moon, who's my sash mother. And I know it means a lot to, to Shay. Um, let me, let me try and continue this. Let me do what I can. And she agreed and, and we came to terms that were mutually agreeable. And, and, and I realized, what the hell did you do? Sorry, I just became a producer. Oh boy. Oh, and by the way, you have six weeks to, to actually produce this thing because the, the date was already set and location already decided and all of that. So with, with the help of Cypher, who is, as earlier mentioned, my, my sub and friend and, and the one who kind of keeps all the gears going uh, and, and just couldn't exist without. Um, I, I wanted to rely on her help. Well, guess what? At that time, she was holding a feeder title for Ms. L.A. Leather, so not only could I not have her help because she was obligated to compete for this title and it would have been a major conflict of interest, um, also I had to throw my, at least that part of my life away from um, everything to do with the title from her. So that was fun. But subsequently to that, we, we had the first uh, year, um, someone else won, and then that someone else had to be stripped. Mm. Um, 
literally a producer's worst nightmare, not the stripping part, the, the reasons for it and the ensuing just, I, I can't even get into it and I don't really want to relive it, but nightmare that just rippled through the, the whole LA community as a result uh, was brutal. And I, think, and I think certain relationships still haven't recovered as a result. At that same event that night when this person won, uh, I announced that, well, next year, LA Leather Pride, we're gonna be together. We're gonna do Mr. and Ms. and by the way, LA Blue Black as well, all on the same stage. And I will never forget walking off that stage. I mean, I wasn't the one who, you know, single-handedly came up with this, but uh, Gus Norris, who was the, the I know Gus. chair of, yeah, who was a chair of, of the LA Leather Coalition and I kind of plotted a little bit and realized that after so many efforts and, and ways of trying to like incorporate and so many women being a part of, of the, the men's scene and helping so like, there's, there's no amount of baby steps that it, it's going to take it, it, unless we do something drastic, unless we do something really like rebellious, this is not going to happen. The joining, the, the recognition of these titles together. And so, yeah, uh, I, I just went ahead and went up on stage and did it. Um, and then you know, everyone was sitting in the audience and oh, big claps and everything. And uh, I walked to the back of the room afterwards and Alan Stroik, uh, comes out of the bathroom and I'm like, hey, so uh, board member of LALC, what do you think? He's like, well, fuck, you announced it. Now we got to do it. Little did I know that that was going to be one of the roughest years already with that. And then the whole situation with the title holder and like, it was, it was gnarly. And, and we, we finally got it through. We got it made. We got, and it was spectacular. That was the first year and unfortunately the only year that Mr. and Ms. and L.A. Blue Black, who I can't take full credit for, uh, Stephen Carlisle and, and Shelley and, and, and a few others, uh, kind of brought it back and really put the oomph behind it, along with Red Blue Black from San Diego. And uh, so, yeah, that was, that was the only year. Tell us about the Visibility Project. Um, with Miss Los Angeles Leather and all of that. I, I had the opportunity to go to various events throughout the country and in fact throughout the world. And if you've been to one of these leather events or King or BDSM events, some, especially things that are centered around some sort of contest, there's always, or at least most instances, there are flags present. Um, sometimes there's an honor guard. Sometimes there's ceremony behind it. And the flags that I would almost exclusively see would be the, the rainbow, the gay pride flag, the, the leather flag, um, US flag, and perhaps the state flag. Maybe a small smattering of others of, of kink identities, you know, maybe a bear flag, maybe a puppy flag, not really, but you know what I mean. And so it didn't dawn on me until I read a post by one of our local leathermen, um, Beacon, um, and I believe they use gender neutral pronouns, so I rewrite history and presenting the story that way. But they wrote about how when you are of a marginalized or minority identity and you enter a space, one of our leather spaces, one of our King BDSM spaces, where more often than not the majority is going to be white, is going to be cisgender, might be gay but could be straight. And you hear someone on a stage talking about our community and our values and our traditions. And if you're not careful, giving that kind of a speech could have a fairly nefarious undertone to those who don't look like you and don't fall into those majority identities that you do. This is where visibility matters. This is where you know, diversity and visibility and representation especially, um, inclusion are not it out as, as bullet point items or it just left service to. And it got me thinking um, of how it would feel if for once I could see a trans flag and for, for those who, who identify with other identities that have visual representations, what it would feel like to have their flag present 
And so I started a conversation with producers that I would go to their events and ask, well, how come you, you know, we don't have this flag or that flag or, and I think it was at IMSL actually that literally we were standing there during our title years waiting to go up in the parade of colors and they realized that the trans flag wasn't present and ran all the way back to the other side of the hotel to grab a trans flag to bring it back to have that up on stage present. And, and so it was moments like that that really, really made me make the push because the, the response I would get more often than not was either we're, we're a small community or a small event or what have you. So it would be cost prohibitive to, to have that many flags just for one event. The other answer, uh, a little bit more problematic, which is, well, I mean, you know, how many flags is too many? Well, that's an easy comment to make when your flag is always present, mine isn't. Yeah. And so, well, find a need, fill a need. Um, I went online and I started buying flags and putting the word out there that uh, was starting this sort of little from our hearts grassroots thing called the Visibility Project. And what that means is we have these flags that I keep bitching about and complaining about and I know I'm very annoying and well here's a solution because I like to actually offer solutions and not just words. Um, oh, how much does it cost? It doesn't cost you anything. But I expect them to be displayed at your event. Oh, and I'll even provide, like, thanks to Cypher, because she's amazing, um, little note cards that attach the flags that list out what that identity means, whether it's, you know, an agender uh, identity, whether it's a pansexual identity, whether it's, you know, puppy play or pony play, whatever it may be, whether it's a, a, a sexual identity or gender identity or kink identity. And so what ended up resulting from this is we now have multiple sets i think now we're up to 33 35 flags i can't even wow. every flag we add i get excited that until covid we're traversing the country in fact some even internationally going all over the place and it was beautiful to see especially events that i was able to attend and help put these flags up in the big ballroom or whatever and then they'd be this beautiful just mosaic of of color and, and, and see people walk into the room who looked at this flag and did a double take and go, oh my God, my, my flag is present. Or the flip side, people walking around the room going, oh, I didn't even know about this identity. That's one of the core elements of what spoke to me about why leather is where my home was found, where, where, why, why it wasn't the, just the, the regular BDSM or King communities or, or even the pro community. That, that, that aspect of a, of a cause greater than myself, of the, the philanthropic history, um, especially in times of great need, individual need or community need, where we really come together. Uh, that's what spoke to me. What's the biggest misconception about you? I, I think I'm still figuring that out. I think while this, this pandemic that we're dealing with that is just, I, I can't even find the words, just, just devastated um, the world. Yeah. It has also, at the same time, challenged me personally in, in many ways I had never thought of. Um, and I've grown as a result. How have you grown from it? I realized a lot of mistakes that I made realized a lot of misconceptions about myself. Um, I realized that I was probably not as good of a person as I thought I was. Um, I realized that the most important core value that I have, um, which is integrity, I wasn't as good at walking that walk as I thought I was. That's a strong statement. The most um, overlooked element of integrity when I ask someone, when I've had, I've been sitting behind a judge's table asking, grilling a contestant at a leather contest or just a personal conversation. Everyone gets right the part of like, you do what you say, you say what you do. To me, what's even more important, it's, it's not that you don't screw up. Everyone's going to screw up. Living your life thinking that you're perfect and one sidestep might not 
want to try like that's the mistake the most important thing to me is what do you do after do you wait till someone brings to your attention how you harm them how you hurt them or do you recognize it and step up and, and, and do it um, do that process of accountability scarlet sin thank you very much my pleasure. I'm overjoyed to include you.